Hello, Uggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes from Tyson Card, who is KK7TCC. Now, this isn't really a question so much as a collection of questions, so let's just go through them kind of individually and see what we can do. The fundamental thing we are dealing with here is an attic antenna. And his goals are to get as much bandwidth as he can on each of the bands. And uh, also he's concerned about grounding, lightning grounding, and so on. So he says, thanks for all the videos. I submitted this question in the comments of video 1114. I love people who comment. They really help the, uh, the YouTube algorithm decide who to promote and so on. But the fact is I don't have time to read the comments. So um, what I am going to do is have my assistant go through the comments about once a week and pick out all the ones that are uh, super comments, those that you add a couple extra dollars to, so that uh, we can make sure that we send the appropriate thank you and so on. Um, now, I know this is unfortunate. If, you, if it comes to your attention that there's a comment up there that should not belong, rather than argue with the guy, send me an email at askdave at arrl.org. Now, I will mention that the ARRL has recently, and that is in June and July of 2024, gone through as a victim of an incredibly vicious cyber attack that basically destroyed all their systems. I mean, it even brought their telephone system down. They're trying to recover from this so that they can continue to provide the same level of support that they have in the past. If it turns out that I'm not hearing from you, send an email to askdaveARRL, all one word, askdaveARRL at gmail.com, and that will get through to me. That's an independent email. But my primary email is the ARRL one. Okay, so as I'm a new ham, but uh, in the process of decoding how to get my first HF rig up and running. Well, that means he's general class, so congratulations to you for persevering and getting your license. I like the ICOM 7300, so do I. It's a good radio. It's less expensive now. There are Yesu radios that some people look like, but the reference station radio that I have here is an ICOM 7300. Okay, so whenever I do any explanations of how to operate the radio and so on, I use the 7300 uh, for what it's worth there. Waiting for the best sale price. Everybody is waiting for the best sale price. Oh, reminds me of, uh, you know, much earlier in my life when I would dabble a bit in the stock market and the stock would go down. I said, well, if I wait just a little bit longer, it'll go back up. I remember a stock that I had, Global Star. It went from a high of $32,000 down to $18,000. Called my broker and said, should we sell? He says, oh, it's going to come back up. Well, it didn't. It went all the way down to zero. And I lost all that money. The only thing that I gained was sent it to my tax man, and he was able to do a tax loss for it. I got $400 back, I think. So waiting for the best sale price? Well, good luck. Um, there are sales. There will be sales around Christmas, Thanksgiving, maybe around Labor Day. Sometimes these things go on sale. I wouldn't wait too long, but uh, go ahead and get it. If you're looking for an alternative to the ICOM radio, Yesu has come out with some very interesting radios recently. The FT710 and the FTDX10. And they're priced a couple hundred dollars apart. The FTDX radios have their contesting style front ends, roofing filters, and things like that. The FT710 is a more balanced radio for your average hand and is a good entry-level radio, but will stay with you for several years because it'll take you a long time to outgrow it. Now, the same can be said of the ICOM uh, 7300, the IC7300. Great radio. I've loved it, but it's been on the market for quite a few years, and we'll have to wait and see how ICOM responds to these Yesu radios. I mean, I have the ICOM 
7300. I have no issues with it, none whatsoever. He likes the ICOM 7310. Says, as far as antennas go, I am in an HOA. It's very hard to find a home that's not in an HOA. There is a move afoot, has been for years, many years, decades, to have the FCC override private restrictions on antennas. See, there's two ways you can restrict antennas. You can do it via the local planning board. That's a governmental restriction. And the FCC has already issued a PRB 1, which supersedes that. It says that hams need antennas and that the local government can't override that. Unfortunately, in the area of private covenants, which is the case in your HOA, you voluntarily signed up for those. And so the FCC views that you are uh, responsible to live up to them. However, there have been several bills put before Congress. There are some congressmen who are hams and trying to remedy that situation by providing the same kind of support that PRB1 does to private contracts, such as the one you sign with the HOA, okay, which would allow you an external antenna. Now, you still have to negotiate with the HOA as over to the size, shape, and so on. So if you put up a 175-foot tower in your backyard, painted alternately white and uh, red with the beacon flashing on top, very few cities are going to go along with that. For one thing, if it falls, it's definitely a hazard to life and property. But a 35-foot tower, that's what they allow automatically here in Uray County, and you can apply for a 50-foot tower if you want. In fact, I was involved in the planning meetings that led to that uh, special allowance for ham radio operators. Specifically, he's been looking at the Kellerman 11500-4251. This is a trapped dipole 40 through 10. Uh, it's a little expensive. It's around $245. You can get uh, also along that same line the Alpha Delta 80 through 10 uh, trapped dipole 2. I looked up this antenna on the DX Engineering website and noted that it is 38 feet long. So I will tell you right out of the box, you're only going to be able to cover half of 40 meters. So you can set it, you can tune it for which half you want. The lower half will give you FT8, the upper half will give you single sideband. So pays your money and takes your choice. Now, if you have more room than that in your attic, you could put up a NFED dipole, something like that, that could cover all of 40, 20, 15, and 10. The Kellerman will, will work. Okay, of course, any attic antenna is a compromise antenna. Now, do some investigation of your roofing materials. Sometimes the insulation that is up there on the roof is foil backed. Take a uh, volt ohm milliammeter or your voltmeter and check the resistance on that and see if it's just plastic or if it is actually metal foil. If it is actually metal foil, you've got a Faraday cage in that attic. Putting up that antenna won't do you any good. And check that what's on top, if you've got a metal roof, forget it. But if it's an asphalt shingle roof, it's normally covered with plywood, and then underneath that there's some insulation. Make sure that it's not conductive insulation. And then you, it's that roof is essentially transparent uh, to that antenna at RF. So now another thing that you could look at depending on what your HOA is willing to put up with and how much room you've got in your backyard, but the ARRL makes for less than $100 an NFED half-wave antenna 40 through 10 and you can stick the end of that up under the eaves and all that is stretched out away from the house down to the fence post or up to a tree or something is 66 feet of uh, gray wire and it's very hard to see so that would be another choice too so let's take a look at this as we go we have kids and dogs so a vertical with radials in my backyard isn't going to work you could get one of the verticals that uh, does not need uh, radials uh, but you need to put the base of them up about 10 feet. Now that's fine 
especially for the kids. But there will be a mast and there will be some guy ropes that uh, kids can run into. I had a deer come through our backyard at high speed and it ran right up the guy rope to my MFJ cobweb. Uh, pulled the stake out of the ground. The cobweb collapsed with the deer in the middle of it. Now the deer wasn't going to stay there and it just kicked and fought till it got out. And unfortunately it broke everything, broke all the wires, broke all the stays. Uh, the the uh, antenna ended up in the trash can. So that's something that uh, you need to look out for depending on what kind of wildlife you have there. I am hoping you can offer any general feedback in this type of setup, as well as anything I might be overlooking here. More specifically, I am confused with grounding this type of system. Okay, it is in the attic. My standard recommendation would be that you run the wire for this antenna out the side of the house, down to your station ground. You are going to have a station ground, right? Put a lightning arrestor there and then route it inside the house to your station. I recommend that for the lightning type of thing. If you do have the kind of roof that is inherently okay for an attic antenna, then yes, lightning can get into the house or a nearby strike can induce a fairly large voltage across that antenna. And you want some place for that to go. Now, that's my recommendation. I will tell you that a lot of hams with attic antennas don't provide direct grounding for the antenna. Confused about typing this grounding. Since it's in the attic, does it need a lightning ground? I would recommend it. Does it require ground to transmit and receive clearly? In my humble opinion, yes. Now, I know there's a YouTube video from Dayton from the A. RRL forum that's making the rounds right now about actually not needing a ground and saying the only thing you need a ground for is lightning protection. I know the person who said that. I have infinite respect for her. She's a PhD. She works at Apple. She does magnificent things. She's explained a number of things to me when I've met her one-on-one. -on -one. She's the ARRL second vice president right now, I think. And so she's a high mucky muck in the ARRL and she knows Maxwell's equations backwards and forwards. She says you don't need a ground if you use ferrite beads to separate this, that, and the other. Or you could put it in the ground and not bother with ferrite beads. One thing she and I disagree on is whether the ground will help your signal. And my answer is yes. Hers is no if you put all the ferrite beads in place. We may both be right, but I would recommend that you have a station ground for your station outside next to the house right outside the window where your station is okay and that you have the standard single point ground and bring everything down to grounding for that that's for lightning it will also help the noise factor on some of the antennas i remember putting in an antenna a butternut hf9v and I, it was grounded out at the antenna, and I brought it into the shack, and there was more noise on there than I knew what to do with. So I went and, and just touched the, I put a little coax barrel connector in there and touched that to the station ground, and poof, the noise went away. So I am an advocate of grounding your station for the purpose of reducing the noise. Should this ground be bonded or just run through the receptacle wiring. Bonded, please. The only point where you should touch the receptacle wiring is your power supply, probably will, okay? Some power supplies, I used to say all, but then I ran across one that didn't, will connect the ground lead out to the receptacle ground. Just leave that ground alone be, and then bond or connect your local ground wire to your utility wire. And I think you'll find that will work quite well. I have also attached an image from our local assessor to demonstrate two potential layouts. You can do all kinds of things. And by the way, running that wire zigzag is a perfectly legitimate way to do that. I have for a wire in the attic, let's see, I have about 60 feet to play with on layout A and presume I can safely get around 80 feet out of layout B. If you can, I might recommend that ARRL antenna will give you the same bands. It will give you 
all of 40, all of 40, so you can get FT8 and single sideband, and is much less expensive than the antenna you are considering. Says, I certainly, certainly appreciate your time putting out the videos. Great resource to the New Ham community. And best wishes from Tyson Card. Okay, so um, I think what we've learned here is that grounding is primarily for lighting. We know that. But grounding can also help with RF noise. If it still doesn't help, you can go the ferrite bead route and, and put those on absolutely every connection everywhere and on your appliances and so on and so forth. Amazon would love to have you spend a fortune on ferrite beads or clamp-on types of beads. Okay, so another thing we've learned is that antennas can be very flexible. Now, a couple things about antennas. Uh, first, everything affects everything. Okay, so if you happen to be laying out your antenna right on top of some wiring running in the floor of the attic, they can couple. Okay, also grounding for lightning I think is wise. I've not met very many people that ground their attic antennas except to ground them to the station ground. Okay, I would put in a lightning arrestor there, but you don't have to. Again, amateur best practice would be to put the lightning arrestors there but you don't have to. So you've got lots of things to play with. Now that ARRL antenna I mentioned you can get from the ARRL store and it's the only antenna they sell. Now the box on it is from the manufacturer tells you that it actually will work up to 80 meters. So you could put if you had lots of room in there, but that would take 132 feet in your attic. Like I said, try that gray wire outdoors because it's entirely possible. No one will even notice that it's there. So there you have it. And good luck with your antennas. So I touched on quite a few topics today, and I thank you for bringing them up. If you have watched this video this far, you are a good candidate to subscribe, click like, and even go and join my Patreon group at patreon.com slash ke0og. And so, until we next meet, 73.